Shalom Malachim, peace be upon you, and welcome back to the broadcast. I'm Sean, your host. Website www.scriptureandprophecy.com. That's where you go to support this broadcast. And uh, I just want to say thank you to those of you who are Patreon subscribers um, who will help support this and make this happen. And the same to those who. Uh, contribute through PayPal or through the P.O. Box. Uh, Thank you so much. Uh, Far more than I deserve for doing this work uh, because this work is a blessing to me and it's it's, um, my honor to do it. And so I just wanted to take a second and say thank you uh, to all of you. And thank you to all of you who pray for the podcast. Uh, I appreciate that. Today... Uh, We're doing our gospel portion, which is Mark chapter 12, verse 35 through 44. And then we're going to be looking at the book of Acts, I believe we're ready for chapter 8, I think. Um, Which has a very interesting uh, story in it about Philip. Um, So we're going to be taking a look at that. We're going to have to look into some Hebrew a little bit. We're going to have to look into some Greek a little bit. Uh, Should be an interesting uh, podcast this morning. Uh, so without further delay, uh, let's go ahead and dig right in. We're going to be using the King James Bible. We're looking at, we're just going to start with our gospel portion, which is Mark chapter 12, verse 35 through 44. Here's what it says. And Jesus answered and said, while he taught in the temple, How say the scribes that Christ is the son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Ghost, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. David therefore himself calleth him Lord. And whence then is he then his son? And the common people heard him gladly. And he said unto them in his doctrine, Beware of the scribes, which love to go in long clothing, and love salutations in the marketplace, and the chief seats in the synagogues, and the uppermost rooms at the feast, which devour widows' houses for a a pretense, make long prayers. These shall receive greater damnation. And Jesus sat over against the treasury, And beheld how the people cast money into the treasury, and many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor woman, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. And he called unto him his disciples, and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that the poor widow hath cast in more than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance. But she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. All right, so that's uh, the gospel portion. Let's take a look at a couple things. Jesus starts by uh, explaining, and, you know, one of the best way to open people's eyes about any topic is not to start drilling them with all your information, but to ask them questions that force them to have to think. And Jesus is saying, Hey, you know Psalm 110? Where David says, uh, The Lord saith unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thy enemies a footstool? Uh, How, why is it that the scribes and the Pharisees are teaching that 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 David's talking about him? that David's talking about his son. Uh, he, he calls him Lord. And so Jesus is making the point that, hey, that scripture is, is about the Messiah. And he says, and there's a few things that are interesting about this. Number one, Jesus is confirming that David wasn't just speaking on his own, but he was speaking by the power of the Holy Ghost. Because verse 36 says, For David himself said by the Holy Ghost, the Lord sit said to my Lord. And of course, the scriptures don't really say in the Hebrew that the Lord said unto my Lord. What it actually says is that Yehovah said unto my Adonai, 
sit at my right hand till I make thy enemies thy footstool. Now Adonai or Adon or Adonai, that does get translated as Lord in the scriptures and should because it means Lord. But the capital L-O-R-D, like we discussed in a previous podcast, that's the name of God. And so you run into that uh, all throughout the English scriptures. But it's it, what he's saying is that David said by the Holy Ghost, Jehovah said to my Lord, sit at thou, sit thou on my right hand till I make my enemies a footstool. He's quoting Psalm 110, the very first verse. Uh, and he's pointing out that it ta- it's talking about him. It's talking about the Messiah. And it says that the common people heard him gladly. Kind of like today. But then, then he goes, and he, so the common people heard him gladly. So then he focuses attention to the common people and he says, listen, be aware of the scribes. So he's talking about the religious leaders. And he says, be aware of them because they like to have the long, nice clothing that makes them look and feel important. They love to get the salutations in the marketplaces. They like to have the best seats when they go into the synagogues or when they go into the feast. Um, they also devour widows' houses. And in, in exchange for money, they'll make long prayers. These shall receive greater damnation. And let that also be true to these tel- television evangelists who are saying, Send me your last dime. And put your hand on the TV and I'll, you know, I'll pray for you and you're going to get 10 times. I mean, these kind of people are going to receive the greater damnation. And to those of you who donate and subscribe and all that stuff to my channel, please know uh, that do it out of, if you do it, do it because you feel led to do it. Don't ever do it out of guilt um, or you thinking that you should or have to or anything like that. Um, I make no special promises to you for supporting the work. Um, but that's what they would do, and that's what you see these television television evangelists doing too, making promises, and people are, you know, giving everything, giving their last dollar to hoping that God's going to perform some miracle because of some guy on television. And then Jesus points out that the woman who gave, you know, she who gave basically two pennies, into the temple funds uh, gave more than the rich people because she had nothing to give. You know, it's easy for the rich to give large sums because they have seemingly endless money. But the poor, who have very little who give, they're the ones really giving the most because they're giving out of their poverty. And so that's the, that's the teaching there. Uh, for our gospel portion for today. All right, let's move on and read our book of Acts. Very interesting story that takes place in the book of Acts. Uh, Let me get to it here. Yes, we're looking at Acts chapter 8, and it's going to begin with a little bit more information. Remember, last week... We ended chapter 7 with the stoning of Stephen. And it ends by introducing Saul, Shaul. And he's holding the coats and being in agreement with the stoning. Okay? Remember, uh, he starts out very... He's very zealous for the Jewish faith. Um, And... And and he begins to persecute the church and Christians very heavily. Uh, remember, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was, you know, he's one of these religious leaders, more or less. All right, let's begin. Verse 1. And Saul was consenting unto his death, referring to Stephen. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church which was in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. You know, one thing that that's come to my mind because I've always, I've often wondered why God would allow persecution. And there's a couple of things that do happen when persecution comes along. Uh, One, there's usually a great revival. Um, 
Two, it will cause Christians to scatter into other parts of the world, uh, which may have been God's intent here. Is to you know it started here in Jerusalem, and then he's then the persecution comes and scatters them throughout the through throughout other regions, uh, which in return also spreads the gospel into those regions. I'm not welcoming or saying I want that to happen. I'm just saying that I think God does have purpose in that. Verse 2, And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Therefore they were scattered abroad, went everywhere preaching the word. You see, basically your first missionaries were created out of persecution. Saul starts persecuting, hauling people off to prison, forcing Christians to scatter amongst, to scatter abroad. And as they were being scattered, they went everywhere preaching the word. And, you know, I've been bringing this up a lot. Your purpose and my purpose, once you come to faith in Christ, is to serve him and to share the good news. It's hard, you know, and it's easy for me to hide behind the microphone and share it. Um, but it is difficult uh, to share out in the world, especially in a world now that's growing in hostility towards Christianity. But, you know, this, this may, we, we very well be moving into the last days and our mission in these times is to be a salt and a light and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. That he is the son of God, that he came, that he died on the cross willingly for our sins and shed his blood and that God rose him up three days later. And that anybody who believes and trusts in that and follows after him and takes up their cross will be saved. Let's continue. Verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, with palsies, or palsies, and they were lame, were healed. And there was great joy in that city. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard, because that of long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip's preaching, the things concerning the kingdom of God, the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wandered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they came down prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. There's, a, you know, that's a very interesting verse there. It says that Peter and John went down to Samaria when they heard that they were believing, but they hadn't received the Holy Ghost when they believed. Only those who were baptized in the name of Jesus received the Holy Ghost. Makes you wonder if that's true today. If we have believers walking around without the power of the Holy Ghost. You know, people, it seems like people want to do everything they can to not to avoid being baptized. It's like, well, do I really have to? It's like, well, God, well, Jesus commanded you to. That should be enough. So if you're wondering about that, Go get baptized if you haven't already. Why would you not? And and if you're wondering 
what the requirements really are for being baptized because I know a lot of churches now, once you do like some three-month program before the pastor will baptize you, which is absolutely ridiculous, uh, you should be able to be baptized upon belief. You believe, you get baptized in the name of Jesus. And again, this is not me condemning anyone who hasn't been baptized. I'm just saying, if you're on the fence about it, I don't, you know, you should do it. You should do it. Is it a salvation issue? I don't think so, but it might be a Holy Ghost issue according to this scripture. And I'm not saying that that's necessarily true. I'm saying, at least in this situation, that was true. Let's read it again. Now, when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. And when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And of course, see, they received it by just the laying of hands. Verse 18. And when Simon saw that through laying on the hands of the apostles... Through laying of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given. He offered them money. All right, so we have this Simon character. It starts out that he's using sorcery, um, which I haven't looked up the word, but it's probably pharmakia. Let's just go ahead and look it up. This guy, this character, is struggling to to come out of his paganism. So let's go to Acts chapter 8 here, my e-sword. Let's go to verse 11 real quick. It says that he had bewitched them with sorceries. Uh, nope, that one is magia, which literally means magic or sorcery. So I thought maybe it would be pharmakia because the one of the crimes of Mystery Babylon is that it deceives the nations using sorcery, but the word there is pharmakia, where we get the words pharmaceuticals. Um, we can talk about that again some other time. All right, so we have this Simon character in Samaria. He's deceived a bunch of people with using magic, tricks, magic, sorcery, whatever you want to call it. And people thought that he was of God. But then Jesus Christ is preached there, and he himself believes. And he's amazed by all the miracles that Philip is doing, and so he starts traveling with Philip. And now he's seeing that the Holy Ghost is coming upon people. So basically what you have here is a guy who just really wishes that he had magical powers. And so he sees Peter uh, putting his hands on people, and they're receiving the Holy Ghost when he lays, their, well, lays his hands upon them. And now he's like, man, I want to have that power. And he offers Peter money for the power. So here's what happened. And when Simon saw through the laying of hands of the apostles, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whosoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter. For thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of thy wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of thy heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preach the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Verse 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose, and he went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and he had come to Jerusalem for worship, where is returning and sitting in his chariot. Read Esaias the prophet. He was talking about Isaiah. All right, so we have this eunuch from Ethiopia. He's a very powerful person. 
in high authority. Matter of fact, it looks like he's in charge of the treasury. And he's in a chariot and he's reading from the prophet Isaiah. Verse 29. Then the spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Esaias and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so he opened he not his mouth. And of course, that's talking about Isaiah 53, verse 7 and 8, talking about how Messiah would keep his mouth shut, would not talk, would willingly basically be slaughtered like a lamb. Verse 33, And in his humiliation his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation, for his life is taken from the earth? And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they were on their way, they came into a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? All right. The eunuch's asking the question. Here's the age-old question. When should you be baptized? You know, he's asking, Philip, Okay, here's some water, here's a well. What's preventing me from being baptized? Here's the answer. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. There's the requirement. You, you believe, you can get baptized. You believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you can get baptized. And that's when you should and it may not, you know, and if you're someone who hasn't been, uh, but you've believed for a long time, that's okay. You can get with a pastor or someone who can baptize you in the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord Jesus. All right, verse 38. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they both went down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And they, when, when they come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip that the eunuch saw him no more and he went on his way rejoicing did you catch that let's come back to that but Philip was found in Azotus and passing through he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea all right so hold up a second Philip is baptizing the eunuch dips him down in the water and when he was come out of the water, the scriptures say, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. So Philip's baptizing the eunuch, puts him down in the water, brings him back up, and boom, the Spirit of the Lord takes Philip and translocates him to another city. He was found in Azotus. And the eunuch's like, what? <laughs> you know, he goes away rejoicing. Interesting enough, that caught away. You know how the Paul talks about how the catching away will be caught up together in the clouds with the Lord when he's speaking about the, you know, the the rapture or the resurrection, whatever, whatever terminology you want to try to use there. There's coming a day when people will be caught up into the clouds, according to Paul. The same word, harpazo, is what is used here for the catching away of Philip. And the word harpazo, let me just pull it up for you so you understand what it means, is what we translate as catching away. It, really, it means to seize, to catch, to pluck, to pull, to take by force. Man, these are miracles. So basically, yeah, it's the same word. So Philip was captured, caught away, harpazoed, translocated to another city. And passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. 
That is phenomenal. You know, there's lots of examples of stuff like this in the scriptures. First of all, you have Enoch who was raptured. You have uh, the prophet Elijah who was caught up in a whirlwind and taken to heaven. You've got Philip here being harpazoed, being translocated to another city. And there's a day coming when uh, all the dead in Christ are going to be resurrected and caught in the air. And those of us who remain, those of us who are still alive, will be caught up with them where we will forever be with the Lord. I refuse to get into conversations and arguments anymore about when that takes place. All we need to really agree on is that it does take place. It absolutely does. The scriptures are very clear that someday that's going to happen. And uh, so, very, very interesting. Very, very interesting. I wrote a devotional. Uh, since we're kind of on that topic, I'll just read this to you real quick. Uh, if you go to my website, scriptureandprophecy.com, there's a devotional there that says, Who are these that fly as a cloud? And uh, it says, I was, this is what I wrote down, it's only a paragraph. It says, I was reading from the writings of the early church fathers, and I came across one of them talking about the rapture and quoting from the book of Isaiah, and I found it interesting. And here's the verse. It says, Who are these? This is Isaiah 60, chapter 8. Who are these that fly as a cloud and as doves to their windows? Just interesting. Just interesting. We wonder why don't these great miracles take place today? Well, they do take place, uh, but typically not here in the United States of America. Um, you hear about these things taking place in third world countries. And quite frankly, I think it's a lack of faith. I think it's a faith issue here in the Western world. Not to mention, if it were to happen, let's say that God were to translocate me to another city, and then if I were to share it with anybody here in the United States, they would just laugh. Any Christian, like if I were to come on the podcast and say, hey, I was literally translocated to you know 100 miles north of here when I was preaching the gospel and baptizing, I mean, who would take that seriously? Not many. Not many. We we really lack faith. We really lack faith. And I'm looking in the mirror when I say this. And that's something I've been praying for uh, here lately is, is God. Give me great faith. Give me a greater measure of faith. Because we all should be walking in this power. In this power of the Holy Ghost. The power of the Holy Spirit. We should be able to perform miracles and heal. And But our faith is so weak. Help my unbelief is a prayer of mine. Give me great faith. Maybe that should be a prayer of yours as well. All right. I felt like I did a lot of rambling on this morning. Uh, hopefully it blessed you. Hopefully you enjoyed the study in the book of Acts and in the gospel of Mark. That's all I have for you this morning. Until next time, peace and grace be with all of you. And God bless. <laughs>